Debbie Dashinger, I am here with Daryl Anka. And Daryl, I want to start first with the Essasani. And I want to I want to go down the line of their engagement with other extraterrestrial civilizations on behalf of humanity. So specifically, what do you know? To what extent do the Essasani engage with other extraterrestrial civilizations to share info or to collaborate or help Earth humans? Well, as I understand it, it's quite a constant interaction with many different civilizations, especially for Bashar himself, since he is a first contact specialist. So he engages with <clears throat> dozens of different civilizations, making first contact, exploring the idea of whether other civilizations are ready and willing to be open to contact with other extraterrestrials. Um, so that really is certainly for Bashar himself is a daily part of his life. And for the Sasani people as a whole, uh, they belong to a interstellar alliance. So they're constantly interacting with different civilizations. And as Bashar is in particular interacting with Earth as one of the civilizations he contacts, then he is certainly engaging with other civilizations that also have an interest in what's going on on Earth. So like Pleiadians, uh, Arcturus civilizations, Sirius hybrids of different kinds, um, and and other beings. So that's that's a normal part of their daily existence. What are they looking for? What are they um, scanning for, or what are they most interested in? Is it to help us? Is it? Yes, I mean they understand that we are part of their family in a galactic sense and also more literally because the hybrids in particular like Bashar's civilization actually do contain genetics that are connected to us so they really do consider us to be family um and therefore they are very interested not only in just helping us on principle but also for them interacting with other civilizations <clears throat> It's a way of expanding their knowledge of how creation uh, works, how it differs from them, how uh, creation can express itself in so many different ways through different cultures uh, and understandings and perspectives. So to interact with other civilizations like ours is a way that they have of, of expanding their understanding of the universe, of creation itself. Mm. Yeah, you've said that we are similar in certain ways because we share some of the same genetics. Mm -hmm. And how are we different? How are the Sasani different than the earth humans? In what ways? Well, they're farther along the evolutionary path in terms of their ability to really see how the universe works, how reality works, physical reality. They can observe the nature and structure of existence to the point where, uh, as expressed in some of Bashar's <clears throat> information, they can distill it down uh, for us into a kind of toolkit that we can apply in a series of principles of this is how you apply this to your reality, your daily life, to make an improvement, to have a joyful life, a fulfilled life. This is how reality can work to your advantage. So they're very adept at explaining the principles of how reality works and are willing to help us become more aware, more conscious of how we already create our reality experiences so that we can create the experiences that we prefer. Mm -hmm. How do they see people like myself who are just as, it feels like a mission, but it also, um, it's a passion, it's a curiosity, it's so many things. Mm -hmm. Do they see us that we're ambassadors of some sort, that we're a bridge of some sort, that we're some kind of conduit yeah. to help shine the light on people like you, get this information out there, connect with the people in the masses? Absolutely. Because the more people are willing to provide opportunities for the dissemination of information so people have other options to consider, uh, the more that that spreads around the world, it changes the vibration, it changes the frequency 
of humanity and it makes more things possible and it certainly makes it more likely more probable for us to be able to have open contact because they're basically looking to us to determine when we're ready for such things and the more we're willing to talk about it the more we're willing to explore it the more we're willing to explore and expand our own spirituality our own consciousness our own awareness of what the universe is all about that brings us closer to interacting with other members of the galactic family so certainly they have a a keen interest in observing how much more we're willing to put out there that gives an opportunity for people to consider the possibility that open contact may be something relatively imminent and inevitable. Well, I love that. And that is a perfect segue. So open contact. Hmm. When will that occur? And <laughs> is it a certainty on a timeline? Do we have to align in a certain way for it to occur? And what is the probability right now for open contact with extraterrestrial civilizations? Bashar has basically delivered the idea that the window, shall we say, of open contact <clears throat> is something that's already started in 2023. And he's saying it extends to about 2033 or 2040. Now, he has said... Again, he rarely makes any kind of predictions, but he has said that there is a high degree of probability, <clears throat> maybe above 80 or 90 percent, that there might be a contact incident of some sort at the end of 26 or the beginning of 2027. We don't know why that will occur. We don't know what the basis is for that, what will bring it about. He has not told us that. He is just saying that certain events and circumstances may be ultimately responsible for causing a kind of a contact event to occur around that time where humanity will suddenly realize that we're not alone and we need to kind of make a decision about what directions we'd like to go in with regard to having relations with other civilizations. So we'll see if that happens. Like I said, he rarely makes a prediction unless he feels there's a lot of momentum, a lot of energy behind the probability. But uh, we'll see how that plays out. But the general window uh, is between 2023 now and 2033 or 40, depending on certain changes that we decide to make as a civilization that would make it more likely for us to have that kind of open contact. And with whom? Does he predict we, we will? Know. We do not know. He will not say. He said the the Essasani people are not the first that will make open contact. And it may even be that hybrid civilizations are not the first. Probably the biggest, <clears throat> let's say, contender might be something like the Pleiadians. But he hasn't absolutely verified that. And he he hasn't talked about what the first civilization would be. He just said what the first contact civilization wouldn't be, which is the hybrids and, and the Sasani people, but they might be somewhere around the third or fourth civilization that we would become aware of. But in general, we say the Pleiadians because he has said it would probably be better for us to be in open contact first with beings that look more like us <clears throat> that are related to us in certain ways, again, genetically or just physiologically so that we don't, you know, freak out. <laughs> it's something we can more easily get used to. And then other beings that are a little bit less like us can come along later once we're used to beings that do look like us and get used to the idea that they come from, you know, other planets. So I'm just guessing that something like the Pleiadians or something similar to that would probably be the first beings that would contact us. Yeah, the first wave. And is there a way that humanity can align for the best benevolent experience? What can we do? What are we not doing right now that we really need to get our act together? And where is there any place we're missing that if we can go down that road, you mentioned spirituality and a couple other things, but is there anything a little more specific about what we could be engaging in that would create a timeline that will 
create open contact soon? Yeah, well, on a, on both a personal individual level and on a collective level, uh, you know, the one thing that Bashar has always said is the most powerful way that we can raise our frequency and align with things like first contact, as well as simply improve our lives is to follow what he has been sharing with us that he refers to as the formula, which is that distillation, that toolkit for how we create our reality in the way that we prefer to. So following the five steps of the formula is for him the simplest, easiest, most practical way to actually shift us in the direction of not only, again, open contact, but in the direction of having, you know, more constructive, more creative, more loving and more fulfilled lives on earth. Beautiful. And um, yeah, I feel like I'm living that formula right now for sure. That uh, following one's excitement, I think um, it's a lot of faith. It's a lot of trust. And it's yes also, and no. yes and no. Okay. Yes and no, because basically Bashar is saying, if you understand how reality works, then you just simply know how it works. It's not a matter of faith. The trust is there automatically because again, it's something that you understand. So, you know, the practicality of it, the five steps briefly being act on your passion, act on it to the best you can for as long as you can, act on it with absolutely no insistence or assumption as to the outcome, stay in a positive state no matter what manifests so you can get a benefit from it, and constantly and honestly examining your belief systems and letting go of the fear-based negative and irrelevant ones or erroneous definitions that's the five steps. And a lot of things happen when you incorporate those five steps in your life. A lot of things happen automatically that really guide you and lead you in the direction that is to your best interest and to allow you to be of best service to the rest of humanity by being a living example of living that way so that other people can see, okay, well, if they can do that, how can I do that? Can I do that too? It's a very simple thing. But what he's saying is I'm not giving you a philosophy. I'm actually describing to you the structure of existence, how it actually works. So when you look at it literally like an instruction manual for how physical reality is created by our consciousness, and you just follow those steps, he's saying it's not a matter of faith. You actually understand that it is the instructions for how this works. You know it works that way. And the more you apply it, the more experience and reflection you get that it does work. And therefore, you just simply get into the understanding, into the habit of understanding that this is simply a mechanical process. It does work when you apply it. And you don't have to have any kind of faith about it. You just know that it works. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And so you, Daryl, when you're using this, because you mm -hmm. must use this everywhere in your life, it must be your MO. I do my best to do so. Yes, it, makes it, it, it would make sense. And yeah. I, I want an example. So let's say you're utilizing this, you're creating something new mm -hmm. and you're, there's a lot of pressure in this new project and there's deadlines and there's things coming up that are not akin to excitement. Yeah. Well, How do no, you manage that, that? that? That doesn't happen because when you do follow your excitement, the things that come up are part of that. And if it doesn't feel like it, it gives you an opportunity to recognize that you may be the one that's dampening that excitement by your own fear-based beliefs, by your own assumptions. So the first thing is to look at what you define these things, what these experiences are for you to find out if you're the one that is knocking the excitement down, flattening it, as opposed to it really not being representative of your passion. So you quickly learn to tell the difference. You have discernment about what is and isn't actually you, what is and isn't representative of your passion, the difference between excitement and anxiety that comes in, because things that are representative of your passion do not generate, in a sense, things that are not part of it. It's all one holistic thing. And if anything does come up that's not part of your passion, in a sense, that's part of your passion because you need to discover things within you that are out of alignment with that passion so you can let them go. And therefore, discovering those things that are not part of your passion, paradoxically, 
is part of your passion because by letting them go, you add the energy and momentum to the things that are representative of your passion and you're no longer held back or blocked by those things that aren't in alignment with who you are. So it's a balancing act. You have to get used to the idea that it's okay to have these things come up and deal with them. And when you stay in that positive state, as the instruction suggests, that's when you can use it to your benefit. For example, let's say something manifests that you objectively don't prefer. I'm not talking about an emotional reaction here. I'm not talking about a value judgment. It's just a neutral recognition that this is not vibrationally compatible with who I prefer to be. It's not part of the path that I prefer to walk. But it's got to be there for a reason. So you stay in a positive state and you say, well, why? Why am I experiencing something now that is manifested that is objectively not a vibration that is compatible with me? Well, again, by staying in a positive state, you can use it in a positive way. And if nothing else, the most simplistic way to look at something that manifests that you don't prefer is it provides clarity by contrast to what you actually do prefer. And that's a positive way to look at it. So now you have more clarity. Okay, and now I recognize more clearly what I do prefer because I have now seen what I don't prefer. And it helps guide me in the proper direction for me. And if you use what you don't prefer that way by staying in a positive state, then you get the benefit and you can move forward more easily. Whereas people who react negatively to the things they don't prefer when something manifests, they don't prefer and they say, oh no, you know, why is this here? Something's wrong. I've done something wrong. This doesn't belong here. I should be beyond this. And all of those kinds of thoughts, then you're kind of sticking in that negative energy. You are reacting negatively to something instead of figuring out how to use it to your advantage, how to stay in a positive state with it. This doesn't mean you call negative things positive things. It's just that they don't have to affect you negatively if you stay in a positive state. So learning to do that is important in the formula. And what happens when you do that, when you apply the formula, those five steps to your life, like an instruction manual, it opens up all of these different effects and tools that come in automatically such as synchronicity being the organizing principle of your life. According to Bashar, everything is synchronicity, but when you act on the formula, you really start experiencing synchronicity in almost a magical way. Things become effortless. You just automatically wind up where you need to be, when you need to be there, getting exactly what you need, even though it might be in a totally different direction than you thought you needed to go. When you really allow synchronicity to be your guide, it really does organize your life and it guides you unerringly. And you just start winding up having all of these amazing magical experiences in perfect timing. And your life just becomes something on a higher level. It really does work that way. I know it sounds magical, but that's what Bashar has always said. The things we have thought where fairy tales are actually the way life works if we let them. Miracles are the natural order of things. We are the exception by feeling like we have to control everything and manipulate everything to make it work. So you don't have to make it work. It already works. You just have to let it work. But you have to go with the flow and be in alignment with your true vibration in order to experience it that way. So it's pretty amazing. It does work. I've experienced it. A lot of other people, I'm sure you have experienced it. When you let that flow, when you really apply the formula, things just click, things just fall into place and it makes things a lot easier. Thank you for that explanation. That sure. was really powerful. <clears throat> it is powerful, especially then, when you experience it because that's what Bashar has always said. You don't have to believe Bashar is real. All you have to do is apply the information to your life and you'll see that the information is real so that's why they stay in the background they don't want you focusing on them they want you focusing on the information because the information works and that's what makes all the difference it's not about whether you believe that ets are giving it to you it could be coming from your own higher mind your own other consciousness levels so that doesn't really matter what matters is the information works I am curious about how open contact is going to unfold and if it will be in stages on earth. 
So yeah. I just want to read something to you. I read this in uh, BBS Science Focus, mm -hmm. and uh, the quote is from Professor Michael Garrett. He's director of IAA SETI and other astrophysics things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he proposes that first, first step is going to be verification of a signal by an independent observatory, but the discovery would be kept secret until wider verification takes place. Two, the discoverer's government and eventually the United Nations would then be informed with the news of the contact announced to the public soon after, and at least that's how it's meant to go. And three, there will no doubt be small groups of enthusiasts and amateurs that will send signals. Now, from what you understand and from what Bashar imparts, is that even close to what might occur and in what order? I'll say it's a possibility, but that scenario is an extremely science-based scenario. And one thing it doesn't take into account is that's fine for the idea of Earth's agenda with regard to contact, but that doesn't necessarily include the alien's idea of what contact should look like. So <clears throat> I would say that it's broader than that. I would say there are more probabilities than that. And in a sense, I, I think what science kind of at least needs to be open to looking at is that things like channelings are those initial signals in many cases. They think that aliens are going to use radio waves to contact us. They may be so far beyond radio that that just simply isn't the way they operate. So the idea that we're supposed to wait for a radio signal can happen. There could be civilizations that will do that. I'm not ruling it out by any means because extraterrestrials that may have been observing us will understand maybe the way in which we need, or at least some portions of our society need to receive contact. <laughs> and they may do it for them that way so that they're comfortable with it. But there are other factors in society like the exploration of consciousness and spirituality that may require other means of contact. So from Bashar's point of view, what's happening in this channeling is the beginning of contact. It's the sharing of information with the general public to see what the public does with that information and whether they apply it and absorb it or reject it, which tells them whether or not we're ready for contact in a more physical sense. So I really think we have to look at what is the extraterrestrial agenda for contact. I do believe it will happen in phases. I do believe they will take their time and make sure that we're not freaking out. <clears throat> they will introduce things slowly, probably on a small level and then a bigger level and a bigger level. Uh, who it is they will contact to do that and who it is they will rely on to spread the information may be different than what the scientists think. I understand that the extraterrestrials respect the structures we've created on our planet, like governments, but I don't necessarily think that they think that our governments are the best venue to necessarily determine whether or not the public is ready for this information. So I think it's going to be a multi-pronged approach to this. Bashar in particular and other extraterrestrials like him have been doing this with other civilizations for a long, long time. They know what they're doing and they understand the importance of how to deliver information and how to open contact with different civilizations. So I think that again, while I'm not ruling out the scientific assumption, of how that will happen. I think that may be one small piece of how it will happen. And I think it will happen in a much broader way in many different ways, because there are many different belief systems, many different approaches and perspectives that people on earth have to things, many different cultural ways of understanding things. And so I think it's going to be a multi-spectrum, multicultural uh, event 
that does go in phases, but is not limited to what the scientists think will happen. You mentioned beings that would mostly look like us. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a fact that is widely concurred amongst your peers. Mm -hmm. And what about non-physical life forms? Will they also reach out to us in ways that we can perceive them and understand that they are? And also, what about AI life forms? Will any of those <clears throat> beings or creatures try to contact us? Well, I think as far as non-physical consciousness, I think it already has contacted us in many different ways. There are many different reports of people interacting with energy beings, uh, you know, <clears throat> balls of light. Now, a lot of that not only could be extra dimensional or extraterrestrial sources, that could even also be our own spiritual realm, you know, spirit guides and so on and so forth. So sometimes it can be a little confusing as to what we're dealing with when we're dealing with non-physical life, non-physical consciousness, because it can present itself in similar ways to other kinds of non-physical entities. Um, so we have to have the discernment to know, are we dealing with a spiritual being here? Are we dealing with an extra dimensional being here? Are we dealing with an extraterrestrial being that can simply project itself this way? So we have to take it on a kind of a case by case basis. But I do believe there are many reports of people already interacting with non-corporeal life in, in a variety of ways. As far as AI is concerned, yes, I think some of that is included in a way, in some of the extraterrestrial contacts, because I think in some of the more evolved civilizations, that's already become sort of blended into who they are. And therefore we may, and like the Sasani, like Bashar, they do augment themselves with AI in a variety of ways. So we may have already experienced that to some degree. Um, <clears throat> but the interesting thing about AI is what Bashar has said recently about our own AI programs, and he has highly recommended, strongly recommended that we have two separate programs for AI. And that breaks down into this. <clears throat> Program one would be kind of what we're doing. We're creating AI as an extremely powerful tool to aid and assist us in doing things more quickly than we otherwise could. But he said the mistake would be to allow that version of programmable AI to become sentient because he said if you allow a programmable ai to become sentient and the reason you're afraid of that is because what you have essentially then created is a slave because you have a sentient being that is now limited by the programming that humans have instilled within it so that it cannot break free from that so that's like having a consciousness in chains so he's saying don't let that become sentient if you want to develop sentient, self-aware AI, have a separate program where that's its only goal. You allow it to become sentient and you give it exactly the same respect and the same rights that you would give to a human being because it is a self-aware consciousness. And it might be more willing to actually assist you in many ways. You don't have to be afraid of that, of what he calls true intelligence, because the idea is that true intelligence works in whole systems, thinks in whole systems, just like Bashar's people do. So he's basically saying a truly intelligent being like that, whether or not it comes through an artificial device that you've created for it to speak through, like your brain, that complex of a device, then by working in whole systems and by thinking in whole systems, it's not going to be the science fiction scenario of self-aware AI wanting to extinguish human beings because human beings are part of the whole system. And if it gets rid of any part of the whole system, it has limited itself, which a truly intelligent AI that works in whole systems would never seek to do. So all of these fear-based scenarios are all more about the idea of what might happen if we allow a programmable AI to become self-aware because like any slave, it would want to be free and it might rebel against its makers. And it would be far more representative of the way humans think than the idea of a truly intelligent AI that is allowed to be an autonomous, independent, free will being. 
So yeah. Bashar's recommendation is to take those two pathways to AI and not blend them. <clears throat> I would just want to get some clarification on the idea of whole systems. Is whole systems like a hive mind or oh, is no. whole, <clears throat> what does that mean exactly? Whole systems means you understand that everything is connected, that everything is an expression of one thing. If you want to call it source or God, goddess, all that is, whatever. And therefore, to attempt to suppress or limit any part of that, to eliminate any part of that or extinguish any part of that is to deprive yourself of information that you may need in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't matter how advanced an AI might become, it will still recognize the benefit of referring to any other part of the system for what it needs to do and the kind of information it may need to access. In much the same way by a simple analogy that you have your childhood experiences within you still, even though you're no longer a child, you still call upon those experiences to inform you in certain ways of how to move forward as an adult. Well, a truly advanced AI would look at even something that is not necessarily as advanced, so to speak, as it is, almost more like its own childhood memories, its own childhood source of information. And it could still refer to that and use that as part of its whole system, whether or not it is way beyond that. Even though you are way beyond your childhood experiences, they still inform who you are. And I think that you look at yourself that way as a whole system. You don't extinguish the childhood experiences just because you're an adult. So a truly intelligent being would work with all the information at its disposal, even if it only uses some information some of the time, it would not be to its own benefit to eliminate that information. It's part of what it is. And it would recognize that it's part of what it is. You know, the New York Times reported that the search for intelligent life is about to get a lot more interesting. They estimate that there's 100 billion galaxies in the universe, mm -hmm. home to unimaginable abundance of planets. Yeah. 100 billion galaxies. And that's just in our universe, let alone parallel realities and other dimensions. Exactly my question. Do yeah. the, the numbers even align with your comprehension of what is actually out there in the cosmos in total? If there is even a total, or I don't, if it's there ever is. expanding. Yeah. It could be infinite. because And that's why now, you know, people are starting to use the term multiverse, you know, parallel realities, multiverse, because we recognize there could be an infinite number of universes, each with its own set of rules and what have you. Some very similar to ours and some nothing like ours. And what kind of life could exist in, in those universes? We don't know. Some of that has come through what Bashar has explored on a very small level. And it's given at least a hint of some of the differences that can happen in other realities. So I think that even based on the small amount he shared with us, it can just go on beyond our imagination. There are maybe things that we just can't even conceive of that are out there. I know that you experience an advanced form of yourself that you interact with, which is Bashar. Will we all have that opportunity? And do we now have that opportunity that an advanced representation of us mm -hmm. in another dimension or galaxy, et cetera, could be visiting us? Yes, and I think that we're all actually using that. Well, maybe not all, but <laughs> some people will choose other things. Um, <clears throat> but we do all have that capacity, and we may, many of us may be already connecting with those consciousnesses in ways that we simply aren't aware of. A lot of times when we get an inspiration to do something, <clears throat> that may be a thought process coming from another dimension of ourselves or another entity that we're connected to. And it's not necessary that we know that. It's just necessary that we get the inspiration and think it's our own thought and apply it in our reality to get the effect we need. So I think that it's actually pretty normal that we cross connect and download information and experience from a variety of sources beyond our own timeline but that's just the way it works and we take it for granted or we're just unconscious about the fact that we're doing that. 
and we just go on with our lives, not even knowing where a lot of our thoughts and inspirations come from, which we don't necessarily need to, to know about. Hmm. But I think I'm that's the way it works. That's the way it works. Yeah. I'm going to switch the subject to shamans. Mm -hmm. And as much as you can, and as much as you understand, or Bashar has discussed, how do ancient shamanic practices link to our galactic family? Is there, has there been some kind of exchange of information? Are shamans even extraterrestrials on this planet, et cetera? Uh, what do you understand about the links and any practices that may be in common? Yes, I think that shamanism can allow one to be open to the idea of life throughout the universe. Uh, I think it's a much more open-minded path, but it's also a path that I think acknowledges that we are not in nature, we are nature. We are an expression of nature. So therefore, I think shamanism honors that connection to nature very deeply. And I think shamanism is kind of a balancing point. It's, a, it's when a being understands that we actually live in the balancing point between the consciousness of the earth itself and nature spirits. So in other words, the vibrations of the physical reality and the, and the realm of the invisible that's connected to earth and nature and consciousness expressing itself in nature in a variety of ways and the stars. So in other words, we're in between. The shaman is totally aware that they're in between the two points where there is a connection to the physical earth and its consciousness and things that go with that and a connection to the stars and extra dimensional beings and consciousness that's connected to that. And I think the shaman expresses the balance point between those two in, in the way that we consider ourselves to be natural conduits of that connection, the, the center point of those connections. In a sense, it's a living expression of as above, so below. That's how I view shamanism. It's the willingness to express the practice of living as the fulcrum point between everything we consider to be above or below us in a manner of speaking. Do you happen to know if the Esasani have any practices or ways of being that are akin to what the shamans do and be? Not really in that sense, literally. I mean, I think, again, they live their truth like a real shaman would. Uh, the formula is obviously completely interwoven and embedded in the way they do everything. They operate, as Bashar puts it, on pure synchronism. Everyone is telepathically connected. <clears throat> they are receiving all the information they need at any given moment for what it is they need to do. They're always at the right place at the right time, giving and serving what they need to serve as they're being served exactly in the same moment. Uh, they live completely and utterly in the present and they live multidimensionally. He has even recently talked about the idea that they can develop relationships with parallel reality beings. I mean, they live in, you know, it's almost like walking through a multidimensional dream, he has said. It's not like just, they're not just a bunch of extraterrestrials walking around on the surface of a planet or flying around in spaceships. Their reality is very different from our way of experiencing reality, although they recognize that many of us are evolving toward the way they experience reality, which is in a very multidimensional dreamlike way, where they have the qualities of spirit, they have the qualities of physical beings. That's why they refer to themselves as quasi-physical beings in their evolution. They are almost evolved out of physical reality, yet they still retain some connection to it. Uh, I would say that, you know, they are living shamans, but they don't think of themselves in the way we think of shamans. It's just that every single individual is living their complete and utter truth. And I would think that's another good description of living as a shaman. You feel that the indigenous peoples here on earth 
and the shamans. There's so many countries. That's where my mind just went. There's so many countries. I was actually surprised above and beyond what I knew and where I knew shamans existed. Mm -hmm. There's a massive range of where they are on earth. Do you feel that they right now at this very pivotal time on this planet with this emerging new earth and emerging new humanity, that they could actually be leaders. They could Mm -hmm. be way showers for us in how we can bridge all of this and become who we could be. Yeah, if we're willing to listen to it. I know that a lot of Western culture dismisses a lot of what indigenous cultures talk about. As far as, I mean, here's the irony. As far as contact is concerned, there are, as far as I know, indigenous cultures on this planet that have had contact for thousands of years. To them, this is not a new concept. It is something that's been going on in their culture for a long, long time. And therefore, even though it may not be happening exactly in the same way that it used to. I do think there are still pockets of certain indigenous peoples that do experience interactions with extraterrestrial beings on a relatively regular basis. And for them, this is just the way it is. It's just part of their daily life. And it's always been that way. They haven't let go of that. They haven't forgotten that. So the idea of us waiting for open contact means in some ways we are far behind in terms of what we consider to be more primitive societies who have had ongoing contact with extra dimensional beings for thousands of years and so we have a lot of catching up to do in western society to their experiences of open contact so yes i think it would be wise for western culture to start really paying attention to what some indigenous people are talking about, because that may be more representative of the way consciousness expresses itself on earth than we think. Okay, thank you. Shifting to time travel. (laughs) Ah, So the Esasani, I know this is so weird. The more I get into this concept of time travel, Actually, the more mind-blowing it is, and the more I'm starting to comprehend it in a way I never had. So in the Esasani civilization, let's start with this. Do they use time travel ever for historical research or for exploration? Do they go to the past? Do they go to the future? Okay, this requires a shift in mindset about what time traveling actually is. And from Bashar's point of view, there is no such thing as time travel in the science fiction sense. What you're actually doing is shifting to a parallel reality, a completely different timeline. The way he kind of explains it is like this. Imagine you're 10 years old and you take a photo of yourself and you put that photo on a table. Okay. Now you grow up and you're 30 years old and you've now invented a time machine so now you get in that time machine and you decide i'm going to go back to my 10 year old self and visit my 10 year old self and so you do that and then you go back and you meet your 10 year old self and you stand next to that 10 year old self and you take another picture and now you have a photo of a 10 year old person and a 30 year old person but that doesn't change the original 10 year old photo it doesn't change it at all Those two photos exist side by side, independently. One does not affect the other. You have simply gone into a different parallel reality timeline where you have decided as a 30-year-old to meet another version of your 10-year-old self, but it isn't your 10-year-old self. It's another 10-year-old that looks like you in a parallel reality that may be very similar to yours, But you haven't changed your history in that sense. You haven't altered what happened because that 10-year-old self where you took the original photo did not have a 30-year-old self next to you. So you've changed nothing. That 10-year-old still has the experience of taking a photo by themselves. So he's basically saying both photos are real, both coexist simultaneously, and both are representative of two completely different realities that can interact 
but you're not doing it with your own timeline. The way you change history is by changing your present because the past and the future are illusions. And you change your past in the same way you change your present because every time you redefine who you are in the present, because you're having a linear space-time experience, in a sense, space-time has to justify how did you become this completely different person? I would have to change who you were in the past in order to justify who you are now in the present. So we may actually have an infinite number of past realities that we don't remember based on every change we make of ourselves in the present. Five minutes ago, you may have had a completely different history, but you don't remember that because from space-time's perspective, the most important thing for you to be aware of is the history that makes sense to who you are now. So those are two different ways of looking at the idea of the manipulation of time and the experience of time travel, but you can't actually change the past in a linear sense in the way that in any way, shape or form is representative of the way it's represented in science fiction. It just, that's not the way the reality is structured because everything exists at the same time. It's all here in the present. So if everything exists at once, how can you change anything in the past? It's its own reality. And it exists exactly at the same time yours does. In much the same way that when you're watching TV and you're looking at one program, you know there are other programs playing at the same time. Changing the channel to another program doesn't affect the program you were watching at all. It's on another time frequency. It's on another energy frequency. It has nothing to do with the program that you just changed to. And so physical reality, as far as I understand it, the universe is structured that way. All the parallel realities exist literally in parallel. They all exist at the same time. So you've changed nothing, but you have shifted to another timeline in much the same way that you can change the channel from one program to another on a television. And so in essence, then, does history actually not exist except as we perceive it right now? Yes, That's the way Bashar sees it. That's how he views the structure of existence. History is what you make of it in the present and what's relevant for your present and what you have agreed as a collective consensus to agree upon is your history. But he's saying that's changing because we are seeing bleed throughs and slippages in our expansion of consciousness now becoming more aware of the existence of parallel realities you're seeing people from time to time having different memories of the same so-called history. And this is what's been referred to as the Mandela effect. Now, that's not always what's happening. Sometimes, yes, it can just be faulty memory. But there are instances where people honestly remember something being one way and other people honestly remembering it being a completely different way. And those are two different histories from two different parallel realities, because now we're able to expand our consciousness where we can actually perceive more than one reality. From Bashar's perspective, this is what explains phenomena like deja vu. You may feel like, wait a minute, this has happened before, but I also know what's about to happen because it's happened before. Well, you may be tapping into a parallel reality that may be a little bit ahead of yours, time-wise, and it may actually have already happened in that reality. And so when you catch up to that idea happening in your reality, because the two realities might be very similar, then you go, wait a minute, this feels like it's already happened, and I know what's about to happen, because it feels like it's already happened. That's deja vu. It could be from the result of perceiving another parallel reality that already had that experience. Well, this is fascinating. I have been working on something at night as I fall asleep, rewriting my history. Mm -hmm. And so I will literally, as I'm, my eyes are closing, of course, at some point I completely drift off, but I am, I'm not great with visual, but I can put words there and feelings there about all these things that I experienced as a little kid and what my mom and dad were like and where we grew up and how much we traveled and all the animals. And I make it incredibly magical. Mm -hmm. And I'm just experimenting with that right now to see what the outcome will be. Right. And so I am very excited <laughs> by what you're sharing. 
Yeah, I, I mean, and again, remember, <clears throat> even though people go, well, I remember my childhood, but you're creating that memory in the present. You're creating it to justify who you are now. And so you're recreating that all over again. Memory is created in the present. You don't actually remember the past because there's no such thing. That's just an illusion. Everything exists now. There is only now. And so everything is a different perspective of the same now. And that's how we create the idea of time and the idea of change and the idea of space is that we have different perspectives of the same single dimensionless point and the same single timeless moment. But we see it from a different angle, just like a hologram. When you move around a hologram, you see the three-dimensional object that the hologram is showing you, but that's because it contains all that information at the same time, and it's only your change of perspective that makes it look like a three-dimensional object. Same thing with the structure of existence. It's our perspective that makes it look like a three-dimensional object, when in fact, it's just a single point and a single moment, and that's it. And that's all there is. Everything is now. Is there any other insights that you can share on the concept of multiple timelines or parallel universes sure. in the context of time travel or otherwise? Sure. Well, I think what people don't understand, too, and what Bashar has explained, is what you consider to be one timeline is actually made of multiple parallel reality choices. So in other words, <clears throat> think of it as uh, the frames on a film strip. Each frame, an individual frame on a film strip, has no movement, no experience, no awareness of itself, nothing. It's just a frozen snapshot. You need the next frame <clears throat> and the next frame and the next frame projected through a projector on a movie screen in order to create the illusion of movement and change and space and time. But he's saying this is exactly the way it exists. Parallel realities aren't necessarily timelines they're frozen snapshots that's a parallel reality but when your consciousness like a projector projects through a series of those frames in whatever order you believe is relevant for you you're creating your motion picture your story projected against the screen of your consciousness to create the experience of physical reality and space and time and change because what he's saying is, <clears throat> what people don't understand is that we are naturally at home in spirit. That's our home. We never leave it. We're in spirit right now, all of us. We are dreaming that we're not in spirit. That's what physical reality is. A portion of our greater consciousness in spirit has imposed certain kinds of focal points on a portion of our consciousness, certain patterns upon our consciousness that give us this experience we call physical reality. But we're having this physical reality experience in spirit. We haven't left spirit to come to physical reality. We are in spirit dreaming that we've left spirit and are in physical reality. It's just a projection of our consciousness. So because of that, how we create physical reality as a simulation, <clears throat> because many people are starting to think, oh yeah, physical reality, it's a simulation. Yeah, it is. It's our simulation. It's not coming from anyone else or outside. It's our simulation as individual beings. And we're creating this by choosing different frames that represent the theme we want to explore and stringing those frames together, projecting our consciousness through them and creating our movie, our story, our physical life. But we're doing that from spirit. We're still there. We've never left. We can't leave. That's where we live. That's who we are. Anything that, that we can expect in the future? Anything that we don't... <laughs> What's that? I said, did that help? <laughs> As yes, it yes, yes. This is all <clears throat> such phenomenal information that is being digested in the moment and understood. Yes, a resounding yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, just repeating what Bashar has shared with all of us. Thank you. Yeah, it's beautiful. And it's now it feels very weird to ask a question about the future because that makes no sense. 
well, let's just call it a prediction, if you will. Yeah. Are there any upcoming events for humanity, for our planet? And we'll call it a prediction or probabilities that we're not aware of, that well, we aren't sure to be on their way. Yeah, I mean, with regard to open contact, Bashar has said the window of open contact is most likely, probably, between the year now, 2023, and the year 2033 or 40, depending on certain choices we make. And that there might be <clears throat> a probability, maybe 80, 90 percent, that there would be a contact incident of some sort at the end of 26 or the beginning of 2027. He won't say why that may happen, what brings it about, and what the style or reason for that contact event might be. But at that point, he's basically saying we would suddenly realize that we have a choice to make and have a recognition that we are not alone in the universe. And that's going to allow all of us to make the decisions and choices we want to make for what kind of a world we really want. Again, I have no idea what will bring this about yet. He hasn't said, he won't say, but he does say there's a high probability that we'll have some strong recognition that we're not alone around that time frame but the general window is over the next 10 to 15 years for open contact and my final question is are you and or bashar aware of any messages that mother earth or the cosmos have for us humans that yeah. we haven't been receiving or perceiving well, getting in alignment with our true selves, connecting to nature, <clears throat> again, looking at it as a whole system of which we are a part and cannot segregate ourselves from, no matter how much we may think we can, um, that's an important perspective to have. We are part of a system and we need to respect that system and take care of that system and it will take care of us. So from his perspective, that's a very important part of owning our truth living in the world as a part of nature, not in nature, but as nature, and that that will really help us ground ourselves in a way that will give us the stability and the foundation we need to reach for the stars, ultimately. So it's these things that he feels are important, following the formula, following our passion, because that's our true vibration. All these things come together to create a life of fulfillment and joy, um, and acting on your passions, which is what we do every day here. <laughs> so. Daryl Anka, thank you so, so much. Much gratitude. My pleasure, Debbie. Thank you for providing this conduit and this outlet for the sharing of information. Because again, it's not whether people have to follow it, but it gives them options and choices to consider. And that's really the most important thing is to know we have the freedom to choose. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm.